A dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. John Calvin. Get in the long cave with a bunch of bees. You believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. <laughs> There's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but I think no, he is. And someone knows this for sure. All of mankind is going to end up somewhere in heaven. My mission really is to just help people of faith, especially, to re-examine this issue, to realize the church has got things wrong in the past. For those who are God by faith in his son. Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians 3.17, that's the whole Victory in the name which is above every name. No exception for rape or incest. Uh, it's an extreme. Right now, bones, ligaments, tendons, in Jesus' name, get out here right now. <laughs> you ain't got no sin in your life, it's a good time to die. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Master's Dog, episode 92. I'm your host, Norm, The Master's Dog Dunham, a.k.a. The Evangelical Norm. The Master's Dog is a podcast that was born out of uh, a need, I'll say a need, to respond to some of the false teachings of the LDS Church. That's where it came from. The Saints Unscripted podcast, otherwise formerly known as Three Mormons, <clears throat> started a segment of their podcast called Faith and Beliefs, which they started addressing, they talked about the 13 Articles of Faith. Uh, that was when I saw that, I said, I want to respond to these and show how these things don't line up with Orthodox Biblical Christianity. And they continued on past the Articles of Faith with other issues of doctrine and theology. And I made a commitment to respond to every single one of those uh, podcasts. That was the, the podcast at that point in time was called Faith and Beliefs Refuted because that's all I did is dealt with the, the Faith and Beliefs segment of the Saints Unscripted podcast. Later on down the road, I decided I really wanted to start dealing with other false teachers. Things were coming into the news, Todd White, stuff like that. So I expanded out to deal with all kinds of false teachers, uh, atheists, secular humanists, uh, false uh, unorthodox, uh, unorthodox uh, Christians, and so on. So that's where the master's dog was born, uh, based on the Calvin quote at the beginning of that intro video. And we've gone from there and even expanded this podcast into another segment called the False Teacher of the Week. So that's a little intro for you guys who are might be new to the podcast, some of our new subscribers. Uh, speaking of which, if you aren't a subscriber yet, I would really appreciate it if you'd hit the subscribe button, hit the like button on the video, share the video, hit the notifications, because apparently all that stuff ha tells YouTube that all kinds of people really want to see me, and it makes us a little more available to uh, others when you like and activate the algorithms. So uh, if you would do that, um, also you can subscribe if you're watching over on Gab TV uh, or 
listening to the audio podcast, you can get that anywhere where you get your audio podcasts, Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, you name it, we're out there on on pretty much every platform where you can get an audio podcast if you don't have time to sit down and watch the video. You can catch us on audio, put us in your earbuds and and take us along with you. So all that being said, uh, this today's episode, episode 92, is a return to our roots with David Snell from Saints Unscripted. Uh, and by the way, the, the Faith and Beliefs podcast is the only scripted portion of the Saints Unscripted podcast. So uh, just a little trivia there. Uh, he's going to be talking about some of the stuff we've done over the last couple of months. <sighs> there, It's somewhat important to know from an apologetics point of view not real important to know from an evangelistic point of view. I mean, if we're out uh, preaching to the, the Mormons, sharing the gospel with them, you really don't need to get into uh, how Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, seer stones, all of those things. That's usually not going to come up unless the LDS person brings it up. Uh, but in an apologetics uh, conversation, this is kind of inf uh, important information to have, as he's going to talk about some of the ways that uh, that are presented theories of how Joseph Smith uh, translated the Book of Mormon. Because obviously, coming from my point of view, it was not done by the power of God. Uh, seer stones are not uh, revelatory tools, which I believe is a, a reference that he uses in this video. So we're going to take a look at that. He's going to talk about if uh, could Joseph Smith have um, written and read yeah, I'll learn how to talk. You should really know how to talk if you're going to do a podcast. Written and recited the Book of Mormon from memory. So with that, we're going to take a look over here and we're going to let David uh, just go along and explain. And as we usually do, we'll just stop and address things as we need to. So here is our friend David Snell from Saints Unscripted. Hey guys, so Latter-day Saints believe that the Book of Mormon, as translated by the prophet Joseph Smith, is sacred scripture. But Joseph's story involves visions and angels and revelation, the kind of stuff that might have happened thousands of years ago, but is a bit hard for some people to accept closer to our era. Thus, for nearly 200 years now, people have been trying to figure out how Joseph Smith, if not... Okay, just really quick, this, here, here's, here's what they do. Here, here's what the Saints Unscripted and, and, and guys along this line like to do. What they do is they either put in little funny clips and stuff to lighten the mood on uh, usually on a heavier topics uh, to kind of it's it's not actually a reductio ad absurdum fallacy, but it it carries a little bit of that in making it seem ridiculous. If they can make you laugh about this stuff, then then it's really not that important and you're far more likely to just blow it off. But these things are important. This is an important uh, topic to, to, to understand because dependent on how the Book of Mormon came to be, really... It does and it doesn't carry the weight of the validity of it. I mean, there are so many other things that, that carry the the burden of proof. Archaeology, bibliography, um, or bibliology, uh, geography, all those things, um, which none of which have ever found anything truly to support the Book of Mormon, but we have a, the support for that biblically in... Uh, you know, Jerusalem, Middle East, those areas. We have found the places that are talked about in the Bible. We have found corroborating books where we can collaborate between and, uh, you know, look at the thousands of manuscripts that are there. So we have those things. Um, Archaeology, we have found, we've literally found pots that belong to different kings of Israel that are mentioned in in the Bible. So, we have all these things that, that bolster the, the, the truth of the Bible. We have none of these things to bolster the truth of the Book of Mormon. This, getting back to the top comment I was making at the beginning, looking at the way that Joseph is looking into this hat, this is not the way it is described. He's, he's sitting there with the hat in front of him, and he's kind of cupped his hand over it, and he's just looking inside. No, 
The description is literally, I, I keep wanting to put a hat over here so I can like give you a good uh, representation of, of literally the way that Joseph Smith did his, supposedly did his translations. I have no hats over here. But he would literally take the hat and cover his face. And it said that he blocked out all the light. So he's got this hat around his face. And a rock inside. And he's reading the words off the rock. And yet, they want to make out the fact that he might have had a really good memory and memorized it. That's the, the weird story. With God's help, could have produced the Book of Mormon himself. Now, those familiar with the dictation process claimed that Joseph primarily translated by sticking his face into a hat while looking at a revelatory tool called a seer stone. Okay, let's discuss that for just a moment. Where, anywhere else, in any part of history, in any part of, of scriptural history, of the, as we look at the production of the Bible, any of these things, when do we have anything where somebody takes a rock and uses it as a relevatory tool. Nowhere. Nowhere. We never see anything. And if I'm wrong, correct me, please. Give me something from the Bible where they used a rock as a revelatory, as a revelatory tool. Where somebody put a rock in a hat or a, a, a helmet or any kind of receptacle and put their face in it and use this to translate or receive messages or anything to receive revelation from God. Nowhere. Nowhere. Only with Joseph Smith. And the, the, the reality is, is, again, we have to come back to the fact that for hundreds of years, well, around 100 years, it hasn't been hundreds yet. We're almost to, to 2030, and then we can say hundreds. But for 100 plus years, I mean, until very recently, all this stuff was hidden. None of this stuff was discussed. And if you brought this up with a Mormon, when I was a Mormon, if you brought this up and I watched it happen, when people would bring this up out at the Manti pageant, when Christian evangelists are out there sharing the gospel, when people would bring these things up, Mormons would deny it. Leaders would deny it. It's not until recently, when it can no longer be denied, that they stopped denying it and tried to justify it. And, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Reconcile it with reality. And it just can't be done. The evidence does not support the idea that these witnesses were co-conspirators, and these descriptions of the translation come from both believers and non-believers. So we're going to assume that they were telling the truth about what they saw. Thus, if we're playing devil's advocate but attempting to accommodate for witness testimony, we're assuming that with no prior authorship experience, Joseph rapidly dictated this 531-page book without significant revisions on his first try from memory. Sometimes my genius is, it's almost frightening. So in this well, now here, the only thing that really had to be done from memory is the plagiarized portions of the uh, Old and New Testament. Those are the only things that Joseph Smith had to memorize. The Bible verses, Isaiah, uh, Luke, different Bible verses that are literally plagiarized from, from the King James Version, including translation errors, into the Book of Mormon. So those are the only things that Joe had to actually memorize. The rest of it, I mean, Joseph was a storyteller. We have numerous claims from his mother to other people who wrote about him that said from his youth, he was one who would tell stories. He was a storyteller. So the reality of it is, is he didn't have to memorize it. And well, with no authorship, uh, um, what did he say? Authorship experience prior to he had told stories upon stories upon stories. So it, he had the capacity of putting this together. And, it, you know, they say rapidly. I mean, it was it was a period of time. I want to say it was probably about nine 
But that you know, they'll break it down and go, "Oh, it was 65 days." But it was 65 days over a period of many months and maybe even up to a year. I'd have to go back and look at a timeline again to to get that right. But you know, they say, "Oh, it was so many days." I mean, the sessions that were had were so many days if you break it down. But it was over a, a I want to say I'm 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 willing to say it's at least a nine month period that it took to do the translation. So rapidly, not rapidly, Joseph had time to memorize, uh, make up stories, and put it all together to produce what we have today. Um, after all the changes, because again, that's a, a claim that they make with with minimal changes. I don't know that three thousand changes over over the time of the the Book of Mormon until now can really be uh, claimed to be minimal changes. And I mean, some of them have significant uh, uh, doctrinal issues, like the changing of the, the introduction of the Book of Mormon from where it says the, the Hebrews or the Israelites were the principal ancestors of the, the American Indians, of the Native Americans, to changing that to they were among the ancestors. So from principal ancestors to among, that's that carries a lot of weight in that kind of a change. In this episode, we're actually going to dive into the text he dictated to see a few examples of what his memory was apparently able to handle. Buckle up. Wow, that was just the introduction. <laughs> this could be a long episode. The Book of Mormon contains over 500 references to geography, which Joseph manages to keep consistent throughout the text. Cities and landmarks all remarkably stay where they are supposed to be in relation to each other, to the point where scholars have been able to recreate a map based on that internal geographic consistency. Joseph also manages to keep multiple timelines from three different major migrations consistent, accurately balancing dates with the ages of characters, including timelines based on three different points of reference and including multiple flashbacks that are also consistently interconnected with each other and the main storyline. He balances hundreds of different characters and their respective roles, many of whose names are totally unique. The first chapter of the Book of Ether contains a long genealogical list of 30 different kings. You may not have realized it, but the rest of the Book of Ether works through this same list of kings in reverse chronological order again mentioning all 30 of those kings in reverse order up to Ether, the author of the Book of Ether. Surely an incredibly difficult thing to do from memory. On countless occasions, Book of Mormon prophets made promises or mentioned details that find fulfillment or are consistently referenced later in the text. There's small details that you've probably never noticed, but each one is important because the smaller the details, the easier it would have been for Joseph's memory to slip up. For example, in Alma 35.13, Mormon wrote, And thus commenced a war betwixt the Lamanites and the Nephites in the eighteenth year of the reign of the judges, and an account shall be given of their wars hereafter. He goes off on another subject, but about fifteen pages later, Mormon writes, And now I return to an account of the wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites in the eighteenth year of the reign of the judges. Mosiah 11.12 describes a tower built near a temple that overlooked the land of Shemlon. Nineteen pages later, we get another reference to the tower. And guess what? It's still near the temple, overlooking Shemlon, just as it should be. In Again, none of this is, is that hard to do. I mean, it's, it's basic storytelling. It really is. It's not... I mean, if you go to you know, Stephen King, and I mean, Stephen King has written hundreds of books. Well, maybe not hundreds, but tons of books, lots of books all kind of revolving through the same worlds and universe and, and so on, kind of like the MCU and, you know, interacting with each other. Gerald's game inter intersects with uh, Dolores Claiborne and um, the Shawshank Redemption intersects with other stories that, that, excuse me, that Stephen King has written. And I'm sure that even now, 20, 30, 40 years later, after the, the writing of these books, like Christine, I could probably go to Stephen King and he could really give some very good recall on the, the things within the story of Christine and keep all those characters uh, consistent and I would dare say possibly even recite from memory dialogue that he wrote 
in the book. It's not that difficult. I mean, I can write things. I've written a couple of plays in my life uh, for, for drama and stuff like that. And I could go back and I could I can keep the characters straight in the plays that I've written without looking at the, the manuscript and could potentially even give you some some dialogue that I had given, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago. So this, in a rapid period that you guys keep talking about, even though I would say it's over a, a, a longer period, but in these times, the, the distance between the days that translation happened and so on, it's very likely that Joseph could have made up and memorized and got his story straight and checked and cross-referenced and any of the things that needed to be done to continue to uh, portray a translation that is not true. In Mosiah 3.8, Mosiah prophesies about the future life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and of earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. About 250 pages later, Samuel the Lamanite quotes Mosiah using this same exact title as he prophesies about the coming of Christ. Another example, the Book of Mormon consistently places Zarahemla north of Nephi, but travelers are consistently described as going north down to Zarahemla and up to Nephi, suggesting that topographically Zarahemla was lower than Nephi. So not only is this directionally consistent, but topographically consistent and counterintuitive to how Joseph would have thought about directions. In modern times, going north means going up, not down. Now, perhaps one or two or even several of these examples could be explained away and attributed to Joseph's memory. But these kinds of things are happening over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times in a variety of ways while Joseph dictates with his face in a hat. Of course, this information does not prove the Book of Mormon is true, and it shouldn't be the foundation of anyone's testimony. But it is data, among much else, that should be realistically accounted for in any theories of fraud. And having read the Book of Mormon and scratched the surface of its intricate complexity, shrugging it off as a product of Joseph's memory just doesn't do it for me. I see no reason in the historic record to believe his brain was capable of this. He wasn't stupid, but even his own wife described him as ignorant and unlearned. I tend to agree with Daniel Peterson's analysis that the intricate structure and detailed complexity of the Book of Mormon seem far better explained as the work of several ancient writers using various written sources over the space of centuries than exploding suddenly from the mind of a barely educated manual laborer on the American frontier. And God certainly does have a habit of using small and simple things to bring to pass great things. But as always, I encourage you to sincerely and prayerfully read the book and come to your own conclusions. Shoot us a message on our social channels or check out the resources in the YouTube description for more info and have a great day. All right. So I, again, I when trying to convince somebody of the validity of your scripture and so on literally means throwing your prophet under the bus. Well, he wasn't that smart. He was an unlearned man. That's just simply not true. Joseph Smith was an educated man. Now he didn't have the formal education, but both of his parents were teachers. He was an avid reader. Uh, well, or, or so were, were, I can't say a hundred percent that he was an avid reader, but he was an avid storyteller which is what, and so the, the likelihood that he read is, is very high. He had access to multiple books that we, I mean, we've talked about these books in the past in older episodes and so on. He had access to those books, uh, the view of the Hebrews, uh, things like that, where he could have taken these and memorized them. It's not that hard. You don't have to have a formal education to have a really good memory. To, the, to bring up the fact that his own wife continued to, to call him uneducated and unlearned or, or whatever, um, ignorant and unlearned, that does not mean he did not have a good memory. Joseph Smith obviously had a, a pretty good memory. He had to have to, to do many of the things that he did. Um, you know, I mean, starting a bank, start, all the things, you know, he there are so many things that Joseph Smith did that you would never attribute to an unlearned 
um, uneducated man, but yet they have to come back to that all the time. How many unlearned, uneducated men do you know start a bank, start cities, uh, start build their own army? All these things. These are not the things that unintelligent men do. This is these are things that intelligent men do. That that smart men do. Doesn't matter what their education is. That it's falls into the ability to remember and do. You know, intelligence has nothing to do with level of education or quality of education. Very smart people out there who have had very little education in their lives. So, um, you know, again, I mean, we can look at people like, you know, Bill Gates and, and what's his name, the owner of Virgin uh, Records or whatever. You know, these guys that, that dropped out of college, that didn't finish college. Um, some, I mean... I, I, there's somebody out there, I don't know exactly, I can't remember who it is, but some billionaire uh, business owner that never even graduated high school, that dropped out of high school, but yet still created a billion dollar uh, empire, legacy, whatever you want to call it. So it does not require a, a formal education to be a intelligent, uh, learned, well-read person which Joseph Smith obviously was. And so the possibility of him taking and doing this from memory is not outside of the realm of, of belief. I mean, to, to think that that's the unbelievable part of this, when you, when you hang your, no pun intended, when you hang your hat on the fact that Joe was taking a rock, putting it inside a hat, putting his face inside the hat, and then reading the words from God off of this, and, and supposedly they didn't disappear until they were written down correctly, but yet thousands of changes had to be made to the most correct book of any book, and a man can get closer to by God by following its precepts than any other book in the world. This, is, this was Joseph's claim. You don't hear that very often anymore, because it, it doesn't stand up to the claim. So, is this scripture? I do not believe it is. I've read it. I've prayed about it. At one time, I had a testimony of it. I had a burning in the bosom. The Holy, Holy Ghost manifest to me that the Book of Mormon was true. And then I started looking at evidence. And I had to come to a conclusion that, yes, you can believe something is true without a lot of evidence. And you can call that faith. But when you call something true, when the mountains of evidence are piled up against it, that's not faith. It's just stupidity. And I'll leave it at that. And so, my Mormon friend, if you're watching this, I know that last thing just offended you. Um, sorry, not sorry. I would encourage you to get out. To really look into these things. Look into the, the reality of the, the translation of the Book of Mormon. And how many changes have been made. And then I would say, get out. It's a false religion started by a false prophet following teaching a, a false gospel of a false Christ sent from a false god. And I would encourage you to, to run, to get out. And my Christian friend, as always, preach the gospel at all times. Use words. They're necessary. And until next time, Soli Deo Gloria.